finish up why we ought to lose our life for the gospel's sake. Living the gospel is not merely a one-time decision. Living the gospel is not merely a one-time, one-time choice. Living the gospel means that every single day, throughout the day, I'm asking Jesus Christ to work through me. So that his word, his will, his way comes out if I can, leaks out of me. When I'm with my coworker in the shop, I want him to see Jesus Christ. When I'm at home with my kids or my wife, I want them to see Jesus Christ. When I drive down the road, I want them to see Jesus Christ. When I interact at the gym, let them see Jesus Christ. So everywhere I go, Jesus Christ is seen. And not only seen, but clearly seen. This is living the gospel. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When Jesus Christ saves us, he saved us to be a light, an example for him. This is living the gospel. And often we believe that living the gospel is just mumbling a few Christian sayings, sharing a catchy meme and then our job is done as a Christian. That is the furthest thing from the truth. Living the gospel means everywhere I go, every day, all day long, I live for Jesus Christ. Passing out tracts, sharing the gospel, living the gospel, portraying the gospel. And here in Mark chapter number 8, we've looked at it a few times now, but again, if I can direct your attention to verse number 34, where the Bible says, And when he, that is Jesus, had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Lord, I thank you for this time, and I pray that you would help us one last time in this passage to see your truth. Lord, may our hearts, may my heart again be challenged. May our hearts be, be touched by the truth of your word. And Lord, help us. Lord, help us to lose our life for your sake. Lord, help us to live a life of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. As I come back to this theme again, and it will be for a few more weeks on this theme, it seems as if, wow, Pastor Howell, eventually you say the same thing over and over again, live a life of the gospel. And yet as I read the, the teachings of Jesus, understand that he said the same things over and over and over again. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Look for his kingdom. And then he talked about it over and over in different ways with different illustrations saying the same thing. Live for Jesus. Live for something greater than yourself. This message can never go old because because we will never quite get it. Tomorrow we need this message just as much as we do today. And next week we'll need it all over again. Even the best among us. Even those among us who who have been saved the longest still need this message. Live your life for the gospel. We would think that after a while, we would have this thing figured out. We would think that after a while, this concept would would be old hat. Yet if anything in the pandemic taught us, this concept is not. We must live a life of the gospel. This morning I brought up this point, and I'll again mention tonight, that when Jesus said to us this concept that if you save your life, you will lose it, that this was a complete and utter revolutionary and transformational thought. This is not a normal thought. If you save your life, you'll lose it, but the only way to save, the only way to lose your life is to save it. This thought is backwards in our minds. Imagine... Imagine that I said to our soccer team, in order to win, you have to lose. In order to win, you must lose, and if you lose, then you'll win. But if you win, you'll lose. Great speech, coach. What's the game plan? Losing. Coach, that I can do. That I can do. 
The, all these plans and plays that you've got for us, those are tough, but losing, boy, I can do that. I'll sit down right here. Coach, we can figure out how to lose, but in essence, that is what Jesus says. This is the opposite of the way our minds are geared, the way that we think about life. In life, we think that if we're going to save something, then we must save it. All right, and if we're going to lose something, then we will have misplaced it. Yet Jesus comes and he switches this thought all the way around. This morning, we looked at this thought of what, the, what it means to lose your life. It means to let go, let go of the steering wheel. It means to let Jesus have control and then to be content where he puts us. And if you missed it, this morning I did talk about Holly the hamster. I am thankful there's no hamster in my pulpit tonight. You know who you are. The challenge. If you save your life, you lose your life. But if you lose your life, you save your life. The criteria, though, is for the gospel's sake. Saving my life is not just for my own safety to lose it. Or losing my life is not just for my own parameters. The criteria, Jesus says, is for my sake. You see, when I don't lose my life, when I don't follow this truth from the Word of God, I will limit the effect of God in my life. When I don't follow this truth, this precept, this command, when I don't follow it, I will limit the Holy One of Israel. I will limit Him in my life and what He can do. The longer that I hold on, the longer that I grip and I cling to and I hold this life together, which is at the best only strips of duct tape, the longer that I do that, the more that I limit what he can do through me. In a sense, he says, let go and let me do something in you. Jesus reminds us that without him, we can do nothing. But we think the opposite. We think without Jesus, we can do a few things. We can manage our life without Jesus. We don't think about him in the morning. We drive to work without a second thought about Jesus Christ. We know how to drive. We know how to do our job. We know how to handle our finances. That is living a life apart from Jesus. That is saving your own life, and that is contrary to what Jesus is saying. If you live that way, you will limit the power of God in your life. When we hold on to our life, we limit what God can do. Thinking back to the trunk retreat, the event we had last October, a great event here at First Baptist Church. Many, many people touched with the gospel. And many of you have helped assisting in that, in that particular outreach event, the Trunk or Treat event. Thousands of people have come through in the last few years. But I've observed something while I've watched the Trunk or Treat. As the people come early on walking through the lines and now through their cars, there are some of you that hand out a set number of pieces of candy. Two for you, two for you, two for you. That's fine. No problem. There are some that allow the children or those with candy to reach in and grab some candy. But there are some. There are some of you who have this thing figured out. And you don't let the kid reach in. You take your beefy, meaty hand. And you reach into that bag and you grab a handful of candy far more than any child could grab on a good day. Almost more than they could grab with two hands. And you take that just huge hand of candy and you dump it into their bags. This is what Jesus Christ wants to do. But we keep on slapping his hand and getting our hand in the way. We keep on slapping his hand and saying, Lord, I'll reach in the bag and I'll grab out what I want. And we rifle through it. I want this and this. Not realizing that if we allow Jesus to reach his hand in, this is what he says. If you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. You'll save it. And allow him to reach in with those infinite hands. The hands that never fail. And allow him, if I can, to fill our grab bag. Then life is full and full of meaning. Tonight I want to challenge us to lose your life to the unknown. It's not unknown to God, but may be unknown to you and to me because it means, God, whatever you can see, that's what I want. My friends, he can see the invisible. To lose your life to the unthinkable. And it's what you can't think of, but it's what he can think of. And he says, for my thoughts 
are not your thoughts. And my ways, they're not your ways. And as far as the heavens are above the earth, that's as far as my thoughts are above your thoughts. So when we lose our life, we lose it to the unknown, what he can see, to the unthinkable, what he can imagine. But we also lose our life to the unmanageable, whatever God wants to accomplish. I love reading in the Gospels about what Jesus accomplishes out of nothing. Before the service, and I sure appreciate all the time that the, the team here puts into those videos before the service on live stream. I've got comments back and in church too. The questions, the different elements. Notice Brother Austin was asking one question about the woman with the issue of blood. And all she did, all she did was touch Jesus. But that's all she needed to do was touch Jesus. That faith, what God can do with nothing. The unmanageable, whatever God wants to accomplish, he can make, make something great. Someone said this, that people who are crucified with Christ have three distinctive marks. Number one, they are facing only one direction toward Jesus. They never turn back, number two. And number three, they no longer have plans of their own. This is a life for the gospel. Tonight, if I can, give you three results of what happens when you lose your life for the gospel. Three results. One last plea in this passage to lose your life. Number one, when we lose our life for God, when we lose our life for the gospel, number one, then you will find purpose. When you lose your life for the gospel, you will find purpose. He says this in verse 35, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. That phrase, for my sake and the gospels, brings purpose in your life. My friend, what is your purpose in life? What are you living for? Or better yet, what is worth living for? It better be more than a truck. It better be more than a house. It better be more than a large 401k or retirement plan. It better be something that is worth dying for. Because one day, we will all stand before Jesus Christ. What is your purpose in your life? God has given to every single person a purpose. We can choose to work in God's glory and for his purpose. Or we can choose to be merely decorations in the church. I'm thankful for decorations in the church around here. They make the place look nice. But they're basically useless. Decorations are basically useless. We have some plants up here. They look nice. But without the plants, we still have church. Without the plants, we'd still have church. We've got some lights and some things on the walls. We'd still have church without that. God has a purpose. I thought of that song, Life Has Purpose Now. It never had before. There is meaning to each day and even more. For a joy and peace I can't explain is mine since I found new life in Christ my Lord divine. You've probably heard that song in the chorus, Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. You know why sometimes it's not wonderful for you to be a Christian? You know why? Because you're not living the purpose. You know why life stinks for you sometimes, even though you're saved? Because you're not living the purpose. If you were to sing that song, you'd be lying. Not because God isn't good. It's because you're not living the purpose. When we live the gospel, when we lose our life for the gospel, that's what he says, for my sake are the gospels. That is purpose in life. And that song has words of truth and meaning, words of sustenance and depth. You want to leave a legacy? Live the gospel. You want to leave an inheritance for others? Live the gospel. You want to impact those behind you? Live the gospel. They say, I wouldn't know, but they say it is so fulfilling to be renowned in the world. They say this. They say that most celebrities have been trending as a result of their achievements, talents, and gifts. 
And that celebrities in the world prove, this is what they say, that anything is possible and dreams can be lived. I looked up who was the most popular person in 2022. And what Google told me, whether Google's right or wrong, they said the most popular person in 2022 is Dwayne Johnson or The Rock. If you happen to watch part of the Super Bowl, he introduced or said that little thing at the beginning. He has really big arms. <laughs> He's a beast. Most popular person. But last time I read my Bible, life's a vapor. Life's a vapor. I saw that he was the most popular in 2022, so I could not help but think, well, who was popular in other years? Do we know them? I went back and looked on lists, just went back to 1950. Not that long ago, many of you in this room would be alive there or arriving in that time frame, 1950 to 1960. You know the most popular person in 1950? There's a name that many of you will know, though you children probably could not identify. His name was John Wayne. Now, some of you can identify him. Oh, John Wayne. Some of you have heard of him. But I imagine if I saw a picture of somebody, if I said, who is that, you wouldn't say John Wayne. The most popular man in 1950 lives on in infamy, but he made a few movies. What else did he do? What else did he do? Now, some here may know a few more things about him. I know barely, barely anything about John Wayne. Just a few Western movies. But his entirety of his life is wrapped up now in Western movies. What a waste. What a waste. In fact, we often for um, Thanksgiving feast time would play a movie for the children. And I imagine if we put on a John Wayne Western. I don't even know if you can watch him or not. But if we put on a John Wayne Western, they'd be like, wow, this is terrible. I say, this is terrible. What's going on? This is, oh, this is so, oh, wow. It's painful. And yet in 1950, he was the most popular figure in the world. You want purpose? It's bigger than a movie. You want purpose? It's bigger than a lot of money. 1960. Most will know this name. 1960. Most popular person. JFK. If we were asked, you could tell me a few things that he did. But beyond that, who cares? My point is this. Living the gospel, losing your life, will bring purpose to your life. You, will, you may not be known on any list two days from now. But you'll be known in God's economy. It's a life of purpose. I heard once an illustration about a man who went to the beach he stood on the beach. He stood by the water's edge. As he stood there, he looked back on his path, and he saw that the waves had washed his footprints away. He began to contemplate that that was the way he felt about his life, that the dreams that he had as a young man, now as an older man, the aspirations that he so dreamt about and so thought that he would conquer the world and take the moon by the tail were just like those footprints washed away by the waves of time. He sat there, or I'm sorry, stood there and felt that life had no purpose. Life had no point. And that, my friend, is the way that we will live when Jesus Christ is not, is not at the center of our life. Without Jesus Christ and his purpose, we will look back. And we'll say, why are my steps washed away by the waves of time? Why are my aspirations, why are the things that I thought would be great, why are they, they look so, so flat? You see, when Jesus Christ gets involved, when Jesus Christ gets involved, I may not see my footprints. When Jesus Christ gets involved, I may not see the impact, but I don't have to see it. Because when Jesus Christ gets involved, I can now have a purpose. Losing your life will bring purpose in your life. Number two, losing your life will bring profit to your life. Losing your life will bring profit to your life. 
Verse number 36, for what shall it profit? What shall the gain be to a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? This would be what we would classify as rhetorical questions. We're familiar with rhetorical questions, questions that need no answer. And Jesus says, what shall it profit you? What will you gain if you get everything you can see, everything you can touch, every dollar bill, every currency, every coin ever, ever minted, if you had access and you were in control of everything, if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul, there is no gain, no profit. But conversely, in that, if you lose your life, there is incredible profit. Much more profit than a few measly dollars, however many millions you may make. Much more profit than fame, however much you may garner. Much more profit than recognition. You see, Jesus says there's profit where the world says there is no profit. The world says there's profit in you living your dreams. The world says there's profit in you padding your bank account. The world says there's profit in you being you and you doing you. There's profit there. And Jesus says, that's not where there's profit. There is profit found in me. And when you find yourself in me, I'll make you profitable. I will make you to be wealthy. I don't know about you, but I'd rather have Jesus' wealth. Last time I checked, he paves his streets with gold. Wars have begun over gold. People have lost their lives over gold. And Jesus Christ lets everyone walk on it. That's how he values that. It must mean that his level of profit is that much higher than our viewpoint. You see, Jesus Christ, when I lose my life, he brings purpose, but he brings profit to your life and to my life. Oh, the immense profit that we can have. And again, we may not see it on this side of glory. We may not see it in this side of heaven, but Jesus says, there's profit when you follow me. Losing your life brings a purpose. It brings profit. But last tonight, last night, losing your life brings a person. Brings a person. Don't miss this, please. When we live a life of the gospel, we're really living for Jesus Christ. He says this in verse number 38, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the angels. I would probably come back to this concept. It's similar to what Paul says in Romans 1 verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. There's an element where we should not be ashamed of what he is, but what God is saying here to us, listen, this losing of your life is not a performance, but a person. It's not a religion, but a relationship. It's not a list, but about your Lord. It's not a comparison, but quiet communication. It's not living in fear, but walking in faith. In fact, Jesus Christ desires to interact with you. Revelation chapter number three, where Christ is talking to the churches. He makes this statement, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. We often use this verse in relationship to the unsaved, but in context, it is written to a church. It's written to saved individuals. And the context being and the thought being that Jesus wants to come in and he wants to sup or he wants to have dinner with us. We understand this. If I said, listen, come and let's have dinner, we would anticipate eating together for a little bit of time, would we not, if we had dinner together? We, we, would, we would think that if we had dinner together, we would, we would talk together. We would talk, we would communicate back and forth if we had dinner together. If we had dinner together, it would mean that, that I would view you to, to be a friend and, and you back to me, that, that this, is a, this is a companion concept, is it not? When Jesus Christ says, I want to sup, he's saying, listen, I want to come in and I want this relationship with you. But in this verse, interesting thought about this in verse, Revelation 3, verse 20, it says, I will come into him and will sup with him, and then it says this, and he with me. Now, don't miss this. 
in that verse, notice that at first, Jesus is the guest. But at the end of the verse, he becomes the host. I will sup with him and he with me. Now, I would be very thrilled. I would be beyond honored to have Jesus Christ be a guest in my house, as would you. But I'd also be honored to be in his house as the host. And he says, if you let me in, I'll be your guest, and then you get to be my guest. What a powerful thought. So in closing, in closing, the point of these messages right now is for you to, use, to lose your life. Quit trying to save your life. Or if I can, get out of the way this week. Tomorrow, get out of the way. Get yourself out of the way. I don't know what causes you to be in the way. It may be your worry. Get your worry out of the way and let Jesus work through you. It may be your fear. Then get your fear out of the way and let Jesus Christ live in you the gospel. Lose your life. Lose the worry. and Let him save you and make your life profitable with purpose. It may be your goals. Then get your goals out of the way. Let him live through you. It may be your control. Your controlling, uh, dominating aspect and tendencies. Then get your control out of the way. It may be your anger. I don't know what is in the way of you losing your life, but this week, get it out of the way. He has all of the answers. Life is kind of summed up when we go to the doctor's office. I observed this little phrase at a doctor's office once. It said this, it said, don't confuse your Google search with my medical degree. And my friend, don't confuse your mind, your life, with his infinite wisdom. Lose your life. What's in the way? What's in the way? I don't know what it is, but I do know this. Until you get out of the way, until you get yourself out of the way, you will limit him. Can you, can you imagine what God could do in this town? in this state, in this country, if this church gets out of the way and God's purposes begin to come in full force and God's profitability becomes to come in full force and God shows up in each life. That's living the gospel.